Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand and overseas, with governments constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To make sure you never miss the critical news and breaking stories you rely on, join the RCR mailing list today. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Last week, Catherine Ennis Carter joined me for a discussion on housing and the problems besetting Kaingora. We were going to talk about the so-called Maori Renaissance going on inside the state sector, but we just ran out of time. So she's agreed to come back this week to discuss the Maori Renaissance in light of the new challenge to our democracy from the Maori Party, who want to set up a Maori Parliament, whatever that means. Catherine joins me now. Welcome back to The Crunch, Catherine. Hello, Cam. It's good to be back. Well, we talked so much about housing last week. We were going to touch on what you call the Maori Renaissance in the civil service or, or actually in local and central government. And we kind of just touched on it, but we really didn't have time to get stuck into this. And obviously we had the budget protests from the Maori Party, and now we've had the their announcement that they want to effectively withdraw from Parliament and create their own Parliament, whatever that means. But anyway, you wrote me this letter and you talked about how when you came into central government and then local government, it was at the point where what you call the Maori Renaissance was being institutionalised into public policy and management at all levels. So let's discuss that to start with. Well, that wasn't my term. Uh, I didn't think that up, the Maori Ren- Renaissance. <laughs> it's a term that's been used from time to time. But, yes, um, so what I'm interested in is two things, I guess. One is, um, you know, looking back at the late 1980s and everything that happened then, setting up the Waitangi Tribunal, and there was a big push throughout the public service to, uh, to recognise that and basically the dialogue um, started to change. So I was interested in that because the arguments and the rationale have shifted over time, and it's really interesting. Of course they have. That's why they call it a slippery slope, isn't it? And why, (laughs) yes. (laughs) But just to start off with, and just because we've had the budget, I was just looking at the figures uh, for expenditure for the, the year finished 30th of June 2023, because it's in the financial statements and, of course, we don't have a full year yet for 2004. But looking at that, I just wanted to start by saying that three quarters of the government's revenue comes from tax. And, you know, we've had all this silly debate about how you're going to pay for tax cuts. Well, yeah, that, that, that really rips my undies, that does, because tax, <laughs> cut, tax cuts are not paid for. Right, tax no. cuts are taking less from the poor, long-suffering uh, taxpayer. Well, exactly, and and if you're going to take less tax, then you have to look at uh, what services you're not going to do if you're got, going to have less revenue. But I want to make that point. Three quarters of the government's revenue comes from tax, and as I've reminded people uh, before, there's three branches of government, and I don't think that people actually are very clear about who pays for what and what gets paid for. So across the three branches of government, you've got the cost of parliament, you've got the cost of all the executive and all the crown entities and all the associated uh, quangos and commissions and all that kind of thing. And then you've got the entire judiciary. If you think about the fact that three quarters of the revenue to pay for all that comes from tax, And then when you look at the tax breakdown itself, uh, something like 70% of the government's tax comes from income tax. So Mm -hmm. that's ordinary old PAYE and business tax, but the corporates don't really pay as much as um, people would like. Well, some people would like. Some people would like. Okay. But remember that those two figures – So 75% of the revenue comes from tax, and of the tax, uh, uh, somewhere between 69% and 70% generally um, comes from income tax. So, you know, when we look at what everybody's paying for, this is when it comes down to an argument about what's affordable. 
And there are a lot of people who are moaning at the moment about uh, money not being spent where it's where they want it to be spent. But everybody who <laughs> wants things, you know, they want more spent on health, they want more spent on education, they want more spent on all sorts of other things, and Maori want more money spent. And, of course, they're getting very annoyed at the moment because they think that, that the um, the current government is, is taking money away from um, things. I'm not so sure about that, having looked at the figures, because everything that was being paid for before in terms of all the institutional things that we've got set up around um, Māori interests. So, for example, you've got the Office of Māori Crown Relations, Te Puni Kokiri, the Waitangi Tribunal, Māori Land Court, the Māori Appellate Court. In the past, we've had entities like the Māori uh, Fisheries Commission, which was just established when the Māori Fisheries Act came in. I think that was 2004. So you've got a whole range of things institutionalised into the whole structure of government um, that are only there to benefit Māori. So if we start to look at that, I just want to put that there as a a context, that the government coffers are not a money tree that's going to go on forever and ever. And if if we've got a cost-cutting situation at the moment well, that we have, I'm tired of hearing we want more, we want more all the time. Mm. So let's just put that in the background. But when we look at look back, and if I track through the history, but again, in the late 1980s, after the Waitangi Tribunal had been established with an expanded brief to hear uh, land grievance claims back to 1840, and that happened in uh, 1986, Then in the late 1980s, we, those of us who were in the public service at that time, there was a big push. And so all public servants had to go off on Treaty of Waitangi courses. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion about bringing Māori um, initiatives into government. So um, I was in housing at the time. We were looking at papakainga housing and all those things. And so if you think about the three articles of the treaty, what was happening at the time is that the focus was all on Article 2. Mm. It was all about getting land back and land and resources. And I can remember some of the debates that were going on at the time, and they were things like, can we claim the radio waves, the airwaves? Um, yeah, water. And some, and, yeah, water and all of that. But I remember the debate about the radio waves. And people were saying, well, if it's a resource now, it was a resource back then, so we can claim it. But it was primarily, you know, the evolution was from the land march in 1975. Mm. Acceptance of the ethics of um, writing grievance. Yep. And that was the rationale. And I think, um, you know, in the beginning, people were wondering what was going to go on. But I think most New Zealanders were approaching that from a moral principle of let's try and restore grievances. That was certainly the focus of the Jim Bolger years you know, after 1990 with treaty settlements, with Doug Graham being in charge of that. Um, yeah. You know, there was talk about a fiscal envelope, which was supposed yes. to be a billion dollars. That's right. It's now in excess of four and a half billion dollars have been spent on treaty settlements. So this is, you know, that fiscal That's envelope right. well, got stretched and stretched and stretched. That's but, right. But, it, but we resolved in, those things. But in the 1990s, that was when uh, that discussion about putting a cap on the treaty settlements was really a response to the fact that, you know, some of these treaty settlements involved large amounts of money and people were looking at and, that, and saying, well, how long is this going to go on and how much are we going to spend? So as Doug Graham uh, tried to um, posture that notion of the one billion cap, but Māori at the time activists laughed that off and said, "No, no, no, we're not going to be stopped at that." So going back to the rationale that existed at the time, it was all about Article Two. So the interpretation at the time that I was hearing from Māori activists that I was associating with and government was um, listening to at that time and informally. (laughs) And a lot of this Māori uh, renaissance and let's look at grievances and all of that also came into academia at that time. But if 
If I think about what was being talked about then in relation to Articles 1, 2 and 3 of the treaty, the rhetoric about Article 1 was, well, we were duped because we didn't understand yeah. our Natanga. We was Article fooled. Two, that's right. We was fooled. And Article 2 was all about well, let's get our land and resources back. And then when it came to a mention of Article 3, and I can remember uh, people starting to say, well, you know, if Māori get all these um, uh, land claims sorted and they get land back and whatever, then they'll be able to look after their people more. So the activist argument to that was, no, no, under Article 3, the taxpayer, you're going to pay for everything and you're going to pay for all the, the redress of grievances and everything that Māori need under health and education is under Article 3. That rather presumes that sovereignty was ceded, if that's the case. Well, the whole argument about <laughs> sovereignty was in the background then because, yes. as I say, it was the focus was all on Article 2. Mm. And I, mean, I remember the signs, you know, it was always the treaties are fraud. Those were the oh, signs, yes. right? The yeah, treaties yeah, yeah. are fraud. And now they're insisting that's that right, the, the because, treaty that because, was a fraud, we now have to honour the, their interpretation of it. Well, that's why that whole argument about Article 1 had to sort of stay in the background at the time mm. because the very me- because if you did that, then, the uh, you know, there was a limit to how much of that argument, well, it was felt at the time, there was a limit to how much that argument about we were duped yeah. could prevail because the treaty was the very mechanism by which you were going to move forward with all these land claims and yeah. settling grievances, right? Yep. Yeah. So that was the rhetoric over time. And then we had, um, at that time, of course, in the late 80s, we had the um, Paul Kauwharau version of the treaty. Yep. And that was being promoted as, oh, well, you know, Māori were duped by uh, this whole wording about uh, kawanatanga. They didn't understand it. So let's look at the treaty from the perspective of Māori and what they would have understood at the time. Now, this is where it all starts to get a bit complicated, And but let's just skip to the present now. Mm. So we've gone from a situation where the approach to Articles 1, 2 and 3 by ex- activists at the time was let's focus on uh, Article 2. This is all about grievances and getting our resources back. Article 1, yes, we were duped but was kind of in the background and Article 3 is, well, the taxpayer has to pay for all the things that no, that Māori get. Because they know, duped re- us. Receive. And, no, no, um, what they receive in terms of the normal coverage of benefits, health, education, whatever, under Article 3, because we're all equal under the law, but the taxpayer is also going to pay for settling grievances. So let's put that there. And then now, let's look at what's happening now. Now, over that period of um, however many years since the late 1980s, the land claims have been proceeding, and now we're getting to the stage where I think all the land, the large land, iwi-based claims, um, and we're starting to look at hapū now, that's where. So we're, we're kind of at the stage where most of the large land claims have been settled. So now... What we're hearing about Articles 1, 2 and 3 is Article 1, well, not only were we duped, but we didn't cede sovereignty anyway. Article 2 is still, you know, give us everything back and we're going to continue down this uh, settlements path until we're satisfied. But the change uh, um, has happened about Article 3, well, Article 1 and Article 3. But if we look at Article 3, what we're now getting is, oh, no, we can't just go on equality under the law. We've got to have extra benefit Mm. because it's about equity. Now it's not about equality. So this is where the argument has shifted over time. And I find it interesting that it's shifted that way because um, basically the constitutional and historical and institutional situation still prevails that if you're going to argue for extra Māori funding and extra Māori grievances, it's it's all still focused around Article 2. So if you're going to then say 
oh, well, we never cede its sovereignty at all, a totally hypocritical um, argument towards how the t- the treaty has been interpreted and, I might add, a historically incorrect one. Well, exactly. But that, that then leads to all sorts of problems, doesn't it? If you sit down in the cold light of day and follow the logic as you've just gone through it, if they were duped and they didn't cede sovereignty anyway, then there's no obligation for the Crown to have made all those settlements. Because exactly, exactly, because, exactly. Because you never ceded sovereignty. So, so what yeah. is it? Did you cede sovereignty or didn't you? Are you um, the, uh, the equal of every British subject, as it says in Article 3, or are you special? Yes. That, that's what now, but I'm interested in how far these arguments have gone from the original position. See, back in the late 1980s, no, nobody was really seriously arguing, uh, well, they may have argued, oh, you know, we didn't really cede sovereignty, but that was because we were duped. But nobody was basically arguing from a position that if you can, if you keep going down the line of argument they've got now, you're going to have to dismember and dismantle the constitutional and uh, political everything. You're going to have to dismantle the framework. So it's a contradictory argument that they're putting forward now, but this has been accumulating, you know, this thinking. And I saw, I saw a, uh, a, a video blog the other day by a Māori woman called Dr Margaret Motu. Yes. And she stated this as though it was a point of fact that Māori didn't cede sovereignty. And then the next thing that was built on that was, oh, well, the treaty was only done because the Europeans who were out here were misbehaving. And yes, we do know there was, you know, the the phrase that Russell was the hellhole of the Pacific was, mm. was well known. But she's positing the argument that, um, oh, well, the treaty was only signed to keep the, the, the naughty British who were misbehaving at the time under control. And Māori understood that they were still going to have uh, their own system of government. Well, Article 2 gives them that to a certain extent under the treaty because, because it recognises their right to own their lands and, and resources. Otherwise, why have we gone through all this process of grievance? But you can't turn around and say um, Māori didn't cede, cede sovereignty at all if you're going to then continue to argue for all these benefits. I was also interested that uh, Willie Jackson, there was an article recently, I think it was in News Hub, and Mm. he was moaning moaning about the fact that when we were in government, I, we, Labour, we prioritised targeted Maori funding and we negotiated a one million uh, Maori budget every year. And then he goes on and says, the only way to turn around negative Maori statistics is to run a twin strategy a universal strategy and a by Maori for Maori strategy. Mm. And so he talks about, uh, you know, some of the things which are targeted towards the lower socioeconomic uh, part of the population, like free lunches in schools, um, free prescriptions. He targets those as being in the universal strategy and then says, now we're 90 million worse off than we were before under the Maori development portfolio, and 300 million worse off when you consider the total spend on Maori initiatives. But that's only as it relates to new initiatives. Mm. So as far as I know, a lot of the um, payments that go to Maori organisations for all sorts of things are still continuing. Well, they are. They're still continuing in, in the order of not millions of dollars, not tens of millions of dollars, not hundreds of millions of dollars, but billions of dollars. Well, I want to tell you a bit more about, you know, the flaw in in this whole argument um, about all the additional funding that Māori now think that they're entitled to. I mean, there was a huge escalation of of funding for Māori organisations under the, um, the Ardern government. And as you know, during the whole COVID period, extra money was allocated to uh, the marae. A lot of the marae was set up as vaccine centres. You know, there was all of that. Plus, there was an escalation all the time that was going on every budget. 
about money going to um, Māori universities, going to Māori organisations. If you actually looked through the Ministry of Social Development and looked at the the organisations they contract to uh, for various services and with the allocation of grants, you would find that the majority of that is to Māori organisations. So this additional funding, you know, has escalated, but it didn't just happen during the Arden years. It was happening before. Lots of the um, contracting that was being done under uh, the social welfare, um, social development portfolio, and also against, uh, within organisations like Kainga Ora and so on, was going to Māori contractors. A lot of money over the years has gone to the iwi for setting up uh, Māori organisations. And, you know, these are now operating as universities. Now, that's why I come back to this. 75% of the government's revenue comes from tax because everybody who is not Māori and not benefiting from those payments to Māori initiatives, Māori organisations, Māori contractors, and it's not going through this whole Waitangi Tribunal grievance process, all the ordinary taxpayers of New Zealand are paying for that. And on top of that, iwi-controlled organisations, and uh, Naitahu is probably the most prolific, with all sorts of uh, profitable businesses like the Shot Over Jet, etc., none of them pay tax. Yes, I know, yes. And so Māori are inherently being extremely dishonest about all the stuff that they're saying about uh, the current government is is taking away uh, funds to Māori. I haven't heard that the the funding that goes to support um, Māori radio stations or to Reo Māori is being chopped back in any particular way. Or Māori television. Or Māori television. This is rhetoric that's going out there. And when you look at um, TVNZ filming the uh, the clips that they did on the on the general news about the budget day protests and the people who walked in the hikoi, when they interview them, you know, they can't offer specifics. They don't really understand what it's all about. They're just saying, they're just mouthing the words about, oh, this government's against Māori and, oh, they're yeah. taking away... You know, they're taking away our language. They're taking away the treaty. It, it, you know, it was hilarious because there was a guy with the delightfully Maori name, Hugh McPherson, who took a sick day from his government job so he could take part in the kākoi, you know, like cars, the colonial method of transportation. Anyway, he decided that he was going to, him and his family were going to go on strike and they took a sick day from the government. He was said that he was from Te Arawa to Faritoa and was protesting the way satirity is being misrepresented by a government. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Did Tiara and Tu Faritoa sign the treaty? And I looked it up. No, neither of those two uh, signed the treaty. In fact, the paramount chief of Tu Faritoa refused categorically to sign the treaty when they turned up uh, down Taupo Way to get the uh, signatures. They absolutely refused. And here's this guy who's from Tiara and Tufaritoa saying he wants the treaty to be honoured, the treaty that they never signed. That's right. <laughs> That's one of the, you know, um, I've said before that on the when I've been speaking to um, RCR mm. is, um, you know, you have to remember that hypocrisy is actually very useful. <laughs> 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 well, the Greens use it all the time. They're they're Absolutely. covered by they're covered by the shield of sanctimony and the cloak of hypocrisy. <laughs> well, I want to come back to a couple of points about the history because I've also heard people, uh, even I, I heard somebody on Asia, who was you know the it's become popular not to actually go back and look at the historical documents. Mm. The treaty itself, for one thing, but also all the archived documentation that exists from around that time. So it's been become popular to ignore all that and just keep mouthing these mantras uh, about, oh, we never ceded uh, sovereignty. But if you actually do go back and look at some of that archived material, 
the missionaries uh, took notes of uh, the discussions that did take place when the treaty was being mm-hmm. considered and signed. And it's absolutely 100% clear from the discussions that they did know, maybe they didn't understand the full meaning of of governance in a, um, a European sense, but they certainly knew, at least in general terms, what was being proposed because there are, um, there's verbatim recording of some of those discussions where two or three of the chiefs were saying things like, oh, you know, I'm not going to uh, be subservient to a woman. This was, you know, that they showed that they were clearly knew they were going to come under the queen. Mm. And you know, they're saying, no, me being me, a high chief, being under a woman, no, no. So they knew exactly what it meant. And then, of course, we've got documentation from much later on during the uh, the rest of the 19th century and. So Aparana Nata's famous writing, when he wrote about um, the grievances that people were talking about under the treaty, and he was certainly under no illusion that sovereignty had been ceded. So, you know, we've known this all the time. This has been the historical understanding. I believe it's the true and correct historical understanding. And there are many reasons given for it, and not the least of which was the the tribal fighting and slaughter that was going on, why Māori asked for the protection of the British. It wasn't to protect them just from from marauding, you know, naughty Europeans who were coming out here and, and playing yeah, up. And in, the, and in the immediate years before 1840, Hongi Hika had gone from Napui down to the Coromandel marauded and raided throughout there, and there's, there's records of him taking something like 2,500 slaves from around the Coromandel and the Firth of Thames and even a little bit further south down towards Tauranga. Uh, and That's then, right. And then marching them all back to Napui up through Tainui and, and all of the Auckland area, all the way back up to Napui, marching these 2,500 slaves that they had taken on their raiding parties. Just incredible, and that was just well, uh, that was in the nineteenth in the eighteen thirties, and in eighteen forty, he had subsequently died. Then um, his relative Pony Hickey then signed the treaty. Of course, that's but, just just a few years later. Well, the interesting thing about Pony Hicker, he sailed to England, and he stayed in England for five months. So you can't say that those chiefs who signed the treaty that they didn't um, understand what was going on. They knew exactly what England was and the British Empire and uh, what the activists who are talking about that today want to do is give as the entire reason for the treaty that it was the Europeans who were out here who were out of control and they had had to have a system put in place to control them. So they, they're going back to saying that from the very beginning, the treaty was an understanding of a dual political arrangement. It is simply not true. Well, well, if they do that, it kind of undermines their own argument by saying that. If they say that there was ratbag Europeans and that's why Maori insisted on having a treaty, they can't then say the treaty's a fraud because they were the ones who insisted <laughs> on it. No, but what they claim, you see, is that what it set up is two systems of governance. That's what the argument well, it didn't. has gone back to. But they've, you know, uh, they in saying that they're ignoring the historical dot where um, that are clearly there in the archives for anybody to go and research, and they're ignoring the historical understanding that Māori themselves had about the treaty right up until relatively recently, uh, up until what I referred to earlier as the Māori Renaissance. So if they're going to now turn around and say so Aparana Nata was wrong. Um, you know, we're, we're moving into the realms of fantasy. The interesting about looking back at the history is that um, the modern activists also don't want to know about significant Māori movements of the past. And one of them that um, one of my historian friends always talked about was the Young Māori Party, of which Sir Aparana Nata was one, um, I think William Carroll was older than the others. I think he was a little earlier. Um, but Sir Peter Buck, um, Māori Pomare, um, and 
Saparananata, they were all part of the Young Māori Party, and what they wanted was for Māori to develop, and that was why uh, Saparananata was at the forefront of um, reconfiguring the legal arrangements for Māori land. So they started the 428 Trust then so that Māori could build or develop or have farms on multiply owned Māori land. But, you know, the people who are in the Māori Party now, they don't want to know about any of those people because they were basically saying at the time, well, let's move on from our history and let's not be tied up in, um, in grievance. Let's take the good things that have also come from colonialism and let's move forward with that and let Māori develop. So the arguments that are coming at us now, they're actually ignoring their own history. And this um, black and white argument of simplifying everything to the point where you say, oh, all the white people in New Zealand, you're all colonialists, evil colonialists, you did all this to Māori, you know, it's not a healthy position for um, considering what the future of New Zealand should be. No, it's not. And then you look at what the Maori Party is saying now, the rhetoric from them, they would probably say, and I don't think we're far off hearing the actual words that come out of their mouth, they would probably accuse Nata and Pomari, uh, Carol, all the others uh, of being collaborators because that's where we're getting to with the with the narrative. And now we've it got is. the Maori Party now saying, well, we're actually going to have our own parliament. You know, there's no actual mechanism for them to create their own parliament. And and I see that uh, the Maori king has come out and said, do we really want this? Because he can see his supposed power diminishing if there was a Maori parliament. Um, and so look, I really struggle to see where they're actually, what the end game is here other than a full-blown segregationist society based on race. Well, yes, and that's what we've been steadily moving towards. The more that these rationale arguments for a shift in rhetoric um, have come into play, the more that you can see it's moving further and further towards tribal supremacy as a form of governance and separatism in, in New Zealand. So that's going back to what it was at 1840 when we did have tribalism and Maori begged, uh, for want of a better term, the the Queen Victoria and her representatives to, to please take this away. It's causing no end to problems. Yes. And the primary reason for that was that was because of the musket wars, basically, because um, once Māori started to acquire muskets from the Europeans who, who came here, and I'm talking about well before the treaty by now, the tribal warfare then just became uh, diabolical. Mm. And, you know, there's there's quite a lot of evidence from the time that if they'd gone on like that, they basically would have um, decimated themselves. But well, I want to go back to... Um, fault, though. We, we oh, 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 yes, 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 of course. But, you know, there's two other aspects of, of this that I, I, want, I want to refer back to. And one is the two-strategy approach that Willie Jackson was talking about and again, back in the late 1980s, um, one of the big policy shifts that took place back then was, um, and it came into being with, along with the um, the other neoclassical economics changes that were starting to take place at the time, and there was a whole lot of dialogue about middle class capture of uh, benefits that were across the board, and so. All the benefits that, like you were talking about um, when we were talking about housing the other day, um, you were talking about the family benefit. Mm. So all those benefits were taken away, everything that was across the board at the time, and we had targeting. And so then it became uh, policy was being targeted at those who needed assistance. And that's fine if you're targeting policy in an economic sense and you want uh, to target certain assistance to the lower socio. I mean, it makes logical water. sense. It makes lo yeah. logical sense, doesn't it? Because right. you're looking at need. It doesn't matter who you are or where you're from. Meet this criteria. You're in need. Here you go. Here's your assistance. But it grew out of that. It grew that grew yes. like topsy, didn't it? Really. Well, it, it grew, but it grew out of that. 
And what's happened over time is that because a lot of that policy targeting was being directed towards lower socioeconomic groups, therefore Māori are included in that group by all the statistics that we know about. And so Māori were then uh, getting extra targeted assistance. But over time, that policy targeting has in fact become race-based targeting. So now you're having extra policy and extra benefits going to Māori just on the basis of ethnicity. That's what we're seeing. And as soon as you start doing that, then you're going down the path of, of separatism. And of course, what's then ridiculous about this um, whole move towards tribalism and separatism is that Māori themselves are mixed race. Mm. And so, you know, if you say, oh, well, you know, we're going to give special policy targeting and special uh, money uh, financial assistance to Māori, what you can see happening now with the census there was an increase in the Māori percentage of the population, I think, from the census. But that's because they're measuring it in terms of those who identify as Māori. If you put all sorts of benefits and advantages in the way of being Māori, then of course you're going to have more people in the census identifying as Māori. And so then you've got, oh, the Māori percentage is is going up. But what's actually you know, I mean, the ludicrous nature of all this is that if you're Māori and you're talking about the evil colonialists, you're just talking about what one set of your ancestors did to the other set of your ancestors. And that's the point, isn't it? It's, you know, with this advent of what I call Māori wonderfulness, which I, I think I stole that off Bob Jones, but with this advent of Māori wonderfulness and the rhetoric from the Māori Party, it's like the Māori component of DNA is superior and trumps every other form of DNA to exactly. ludicrous to ludicrous extents. Yes. Uh, and it's just beggars belief that um, that we even entertain this. And you know, and the funny thing is, is that one of the biggest proponents of this is Willie Jackson, who of course, when he was at Radio Live, did one of those DNA tests that you can mail away and get the results. And it came back and it said that he had more Chinese uh, or Asian ancestry. <laughs> and Jewish ancestry than he had Maori ancestry. And I thought it was hilarious at the time. He keeps that very quiet now. And if you even mention it on Facebook to any one of us, he bans you and, you know, has that silence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's an inconvenient. Yes. Well, I think um, just uh, carrying on on uh, on that, if you go back to, you know, the arguments about um, additional targeting for, for Maori, the other thing that's happening, of course, in terms of cost, and you know, I keep going back to the, um, you know, the affordability of all this is just getting out of control, and we can't keep going at at that kind of level. Because no, if you try but to cut anything, you, they scream about it and say you're depriving Maori, and then go down the racism path, and so the funding gets kept. Yes, well, exactly. But, you know, if you make it an advantage to be Māori, then you're going to have more people identifying as Māori. And there's, there's no kind of, you don't have to prove that you're one sixteenth or one eighth or 25% or, or whatever. If you're going to allocate extra benefits and extra funding on the basis of that, at some point, it, it, it does become ridiculous. And quite frankly, it's starting to look a little ridiculous now because of two things. First of all, we've got a lot a, a lot of very European looking people, you know, getting moko and, you know, so that they can physically as Māori. Um, but there's a lot of people, you know, spread all throughout the, the public service who have brought a Māori perspective into every organisation that exists across the public service. So not only have you got the cost of all the additional institutional architecture that I talked about before, where you've got, you know, uh, a lot of institutions that are set up specifically to benefit Māori, but now you've got the cost of institutionalising the whole government and every public service agency with Tao Māori values, and it's right across uh, the public sector. And, and I'll give so you now, an, if you, I'll give you if you go I'll, on the on the, sorry, what were you going to say, Kim? Uh, sorry, I was going to give you a ludicrous example of that. 
uh, I know that during the pandemic in one of the call center businesses that was running, phoning people up to get vaccinated, every Wednesday from nine to 11 o'clock, they had Waiata Wednesdays where everyone came along and sung songs, playing the guitar and carrying on completely, you know, not doing any work uh, for that two and a half hours that they had for Waiata Wednesdays. Yeah. yeah. But even more significant is, um, I know we're up against time, but I just want to raise one one more thing, sure. one more point before we go. And that is the application of Māori mythology across all the, the public service. So, and that's interesting. And I must admit, when the mosque shootings happened in 2019 in Christchurch, um, at the end of that week of um, thinking about that whole tragic event, mm. um, there was a there was a national um, commemoration service. That was a clear, a very clear statement of how Jacinda Ardern's government saw New Zealand. There she was there in her Māori cloak. It was hosted by Ngāi Tahu. There was a lot about Islam, of course, because of the nature of the, um, the, the mosque attack. But there was a lot about Ngāi Tahu, not only being host, but talking about Māori mythological and spiritual values. There was no Christian church in, involved in that. And that was a clear statement of who we are. This is what we believe. This is our Maori mythology, and I saw that starting to appear um, back in the late nineteen eighties, and when we did those um, Treaty of Waitangi courses, and then, you know, twenty years later, when I was back doing something for um, what was then Housing Housing New Zealand, you know, they were still running those Treaty of Waitangi courses, and I remember talking to one of the facilitators about the presentation of Māori mythology and I was saying to him you know because it was it was always conveyed as this is it this is the truth and I said to him but this is just mythology Mm. and he said yes but true mythology as we believe and this is the way if you go onto the Reserve Bank site now and go onto the Treasury you'll find heaps of stuff there about Tani Mahuta and um Papatunuku and all this Māori, and it's put across as, you know, that this is us, this is this is how we see ourselves, this this is who we are, and this is coming more and more into every uh, government agency. Yeah, you know, I was talking to to a guy um, on the weekend, and he was saying, "Oh, yo, this is Maori land, this is our land, it's our tribe's land." And I said, "Hang on a second, it can't be." And they said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, it's got to be." Um, Naitahu's land. And they said, why is that? And I said, well, don't you know you Maori mythology? You're standing on the fished up fish that Maui caught from the Naitahu canoe. Mm-hmm. So it's, it was their land. They fished it out of the water. So what are you talking about? And you should have seen the look on his face. It was like stunned. And it was like, oh, my God, I hope Naitahu don't work this out. <laughs> 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 Maybe we should have a have a call to Naitahu and say, "Hey guys, forget all this treaty nonsense. Everything's um, in the North Island's yours anyway because you fished it out of the sea." <laughs> well, yes, I mean, you know, but that's just the ludicrous. Starts. of the, that's the ludicrousness taken to a ludicrous extent of where it all ends. If you base laws and rules and society around an amorphous thing like mythology and wrap it up in tikanga. That's yes. where you end up. You end up with ridiculous situations and and you you know, many people feel they can't speak up against it because they'll be shouted down for being racist. Exactly. Well, little example of where that I mean, we've had debates about, you know, that have been in the media about should Māori mythology be brought into and regarded as science and you know. Uh, I'm not gonna go down that track, but just as a little example. I live in Kapiti, and the uh, Kapiti Coast District Council has had a huge process for looking at the effects of climate change um, through their coastal adaptation plan process. And 
as part of this, um, there's a whole Tao Māori aspect of, of that that's bring, being brought in. So in the documents relating to the coastal adaptation plan, there's a whole chunk on Māori mythology, and it basically says that climate change is caused by um, when the, the atua become enraged and start um, fighting with each other. Now, right. the, the atua are the Māori spiritual gods, okay, and they're then saying, so people should move away from those areas if the gods are enraged. Now, I suspect that, you know, somewhere in the back of this is positioning in the same way that the RMA became a bit infamous for uh, because it um, allowed for consideration of Māori spiritual values. So next thing you have the motorway being held up because of a tanifa. I think that some of this is positioning for managed retreat to be undertaken and argued from the benefit of Māori regaining access to the the coast for kaimo, for their kaimoana and all the stuff that, you know, it goes with that. So how far are we going to take this separatism, the endorsement of Māori mythology as a way of being, not only for our society, but as the basis for governance? And this is the question that we have to start asking ourselves. So what's happening now, I think, is that as the land claims are starting to move, hopefully, to a close. They're looking for um, a, bigger, a bigger and better trough is what they're doing. Yes. Well, um, you somebody, I think it was you said the other day that um, one of the reasons for all the fury at the moment is that they sense that the Māori gravy train, as people call it, might be coming to an end or being trimmed back with this current government. And, of course, they're leaping up and down. Nobody who has acquired an advantage wants to give up that advantage. They want to keep that advantage coming in their direction. No, they're, they're rent seekers, and they're just uh, wanting to protect their patch. It's understandable. I get it. But yeah. we don't all have to agree with it. <laughs> yeah. you know? and, and so, you know, I guess the culmination of, of our discussion on this is that we really do need to bring the discussion back to history and yes. what actually happened and ditch this nonsense about mythology because if you're going to go down the path of Maori mythology, then you know there's people here with Scandinavian ancestry. Well, why don't we start um, asking whether Thor is happy with it or Freya or, or any of the Celtic gods um, yes. that, that existed because that's how fanciful and nonsensical it is. You know, we see the removal of Christian values from inside government, but what we see is the imposition of Maori religion and karakia and all of those sorts of things. If you started a meeting in a government organisation say, well, I want to start this meeting with the Lord's Prayer, there would be howls of outrage, it would be in the media, uh, there would be people protesting about, you know, religion needs to stay out of it, but nobody says a word about a karakia at the start of a meeting. Mm. And it's, it's look, I'm, I'm fearful for New Zealand with the rhetoric that is being portrayed. Some people say, oh, it's only a small group. Well, you know what? Adolf Hitler was only a, a bunch of 12, 12 or 13 thugs when he started. And yes. uh, if you let the small group, if you ignore them, if you let them dwell in the shadows, then what you find is some decades later or, or even a shorter amount of time, they come out of that shadows and you've got all sorts of problems. And that's what I fear about for New Zealand, that this discussion is getting violent. The rhetoric mm. is getting increasingly uh, talking about method. And when you talk about revolution, there's no revolution in the history of the world that has been held without bloodshed. Mm. And that's what they're talking about. They're using those yes. words. Well, they are, and um, Rarui Waititi's wife the other day made a statement mm. about, um, you know, we, we can bring down any government. Uh, By force you know, was the implication. Yeah, and, you know, is that not, um, I think the word is sedition? Well, I think sedition's been taken off the books, um, <laughs> but conveniently, but, but it's certainly incitement. It could be yes. seen as incitement. And if Labour had passed the hate speech laws, it would clearly fit in, into that as well. Mm. But, but I think, you know, what you've highlighted and what we've discussed over this last hour 
a, a very real need, and I guess this is what Winston Peters is talking about in Parliament, a very real need to go back to first principles, uh, to go back to the history, to go back and look, don't just look at the treaty, look at all of the things that you've suggested, all of the the uh, contemporaneous writings of missionaries and other people that were involved at the time, and include mm. up to the, the Koe Marama um, conference, all of those sorts of things, and, and start dealing with facts, not mythology. Well, exactly, and, and also the revisionist approach to history um, has started to get completely ridiculous. I was reading an article by a Māori academic from Victoria University a few days ago, and it was about uh, this current notion that's now being postulated that Utu, which we understood to be basically tribal, um, intertribal warfare and revenge, was actually a, you know, a very benign system of uh, reciprocity. And that was the meaning of it. You know, It involved uh, exchange of gifts and all those sort of things. So a lot of this is being reworked so that you can argue what you've termed <laughs> Māori wonderfulness um, mm. in in all respects, but you know we've we've got to get back to. Uh, I mean, Winston Peters always talks about common sense approach. Well, we need to we need to have a common sense approach, and we need to actually say no. We're having a discussion about this, and we're going to have none of the children who are screaming. Sorry, you're out. Go and sit in a separate room. We're having adults in this discussion now. I think yes. that's what we actually need to have. Yeah, but some people. I mean, there's been a tremendous amount of, um, you know, this has all become part of the omni cause now, which I think is a, a useful recent expression where all these issues are being wrapped up t- together. Um, I think a better word would be omni shambles. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly, certainly the result. <laughs> and on that little bit of mirth, I think we're going to have to leave it there, Catherine. <laughs> okay. Good to talk to you, Cam. Thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on The Crunch. Okay, cheers. Now you see what I mean? Catherine has been in the trenches of the state sector and has seen this rapid growth of what I call Maori wonderfulness or the Maori renaissance that has been and still is being institutionalised into public policy and management at all levels. She's prepared to tell it how it is and we're prepared to broadcast it so a discussion can be had of all of these issues. Tell me your thoughts on what Catherine had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.